because usually people have nothing to do with their birth and they're just born however they're born and whatever way they're born and whatever family they're born to they don't get to choose any of that stuff but you see Jesus he wasn't an ordinary man so Jesus birth is actually an important part of his life and uh, and something for us to look at and to learn from because Jesus birth was a choice you see Jesus is called the eternal son of God but Jesus never began to exist it says in John chapter 1 that in the beginning he already existed he was already there with God and so and today we're going to think about what's called the incarnation and we'll start uh, in Matthew chapter 1 and in Matthew chapter 1 we're going to get some details about but the birth of Jesus and now we could go back to the Old Testament again as we were at the end of uh, yesterday and see and Jesus life Jesus birth like the jigsaw puzzle that I was talking about that it is where we're given all of these different clues and there's only one person that can actually fit all these clues there's only one person that can actually fulfill all of these promises and Jesus is going to fulfill that. So Matthew 1 starts with the genealogy, a list of names, that shows us that Jesus had the right to do what he did, say what he said. He had the right to the throne. He was the king of Israel. He was the son of Abraham, the seed of Abraham that was promised. Um, he was the seed of the woman. He was the son of David. And all of these things that are promised about him. But I'm going to start reading in verse 18 of Matthew chapter 1. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ happened like this. When his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child from the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not desiring to put her away or to make her a public example, thought he would put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take to you Mary your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And she shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted means God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did what the angel of the Lord had told him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her until she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. Now, why would we start in Jesus' life with an event like his conception and birth? Usually this would be a pretty small topic in most of our lives, because like I said, none of us have anything to do with where we're born or the family we're born to. But it talks about prophecy and how this was so it would be fulfilled that was spoken about by the prophet. And so. We have this telling beforehand 
about exactly where Jesus is going to be born. And it's telling beforehand of who he is. And only one person in the universe could ever decide the family they're born to. And if anyone can decide the family they're born to, and the place they're born in, and the, their, who their parents are going to be, they would have to be Almighty God. And so this brings us to our first, our first thing about the birth of Christ, is that it was a choice. It wasn't an accident. Right? And it was something that he had full control of. It says he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, implanted into the womb of a young woman. Now, each one of us, if we had a world, as I say, we had a world or we had a computer software or something that we had developed and something had gone terribly wrong in that world to the point where we couldn't trust um, those people or that software to do what we created it to do. How would we go about fixing that? You see, most of us, if we're honest, what we would do is that we would come in some kind of blaze of glory and we would, we would show our strength, we would show our power, we would maybe come as a king or some kind of being that would leave everyone in awe. But Jesus and the plan and the will of God, for some reason, was that he would come, it's not just as a man, but that he would be born of a woman. And that he would be born in a stable. That he would have a humble beginning. That he would live a real life, like every one of us lives. And so, uh, the the one thing we're going to talk about today, I think, is going to be the condescension. What's called the condescension of God. And how, how Jesus would come down to such a place, in such a way, that none of us would ever imagine, but that would show, um, that would show his glory, that would show his power, but that would do so in a humble and a loving way. Yeah, I'm going to, I know poems, poems and stuff are tough to translate from English into your language in your head, but I want to read a couple of songs for you to kind of get this idea into our minds in a good way, I think. This one says, Upon a cold and silent night, in shadows deep and gray, a woman, young and innocent, lay curled up in some hay. The night was lonely, still and dark, and yet she felt no fear. She gazed with love upon her child and drew her baby near. Her husband lay asleep nearby. Silence filled the room. The peace within her joyful heart glowed brightly through the gloom. The greatest night in history, the most important birth, the baby boy upon her lap was ruler of the earth. His gentle eyes, so young and bright, would see a hateful crowd. His litter, little ears would hear their scorn, so taunting, harsh, and loud. His tender face would feel the sting of blows from wicked men, the lash of whips 
against his back would hurt him yet again. His arms and legs would tense and quake beneath the heavy weight as through the streets he'd toil past a crowd of scorn and hate. His body would be stretched upon a rugged cross of wood. The multitude would see his pain from where they watched and stood. His hands would feel the driving nails that pierced through flesh and bone. His breath would shake within him as he hung there all alone. And yet her precious baby boy would one day conquer death. With glory he would rise on high and save each dying breath. The mother held her baby close and stroked his tender face. The multitudes would bow to him and kneel beneath his grace. <laughs> so we have this, this man of ultimate authority and power. Now wrapped in a human body. His glory and power veiled. Well, he becomes a helpless babe that would that would need help from the humans he created in order to exist and to grow. The next song is called Mary, Did You Know? And um, there's just one verse I want to read out of this. It says, Mary, did you know that your baby boy is Lord of all creation? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would one day rule the nations? Did you know that your baby boy is heaven's perfect lamb, that sleeping child you're holding is the great I am? There's, there, there's so many songs that speak about this. We could. I'd go on all the whole time just in songs and we would not exhaust this but I'm just going to refer to one more that kind of sums sums this whole thing up it's a song by the Gaither vocal band and it goes like this he came down to my level when I couldn't get up to his with a strong arm he lifted me up to show me what living is. He'll come down to your level if you'll open up the door. He wants to make your life worth living. That's what he came down for. If you're looking for contentment in the things that you can see, you're going to have some disappointment. So won't you listen to me, please? As I know about a savior, he came down to be a man. And when he left, he sent his spirit. He made me everything I am. He came down to my level. When I couldn't get up to his. See, none of us would ever have conceived or imagined a plan this great or a way to demonstrate to some extent this love. You see, in the book of Isaiah, we're called, um, it says the nations are like a drop as a, in the bucket and as nothing to him and worthless in a sense. Not that he doesn't value them, but they're so small. You see, we're billions of little specks of dust running around on a speck of dust, rotating around a sun that is a speck of dust in a universe that we can't even find the end of yet, of which God created with the word from his mouth. And this word through which God created the world has now become a man. He came on purpose. He came with a purpose. He never began to exist. He, uh, he was given, given as a child to Mary, born as a child, but given as the Son of God. <laughs> so doctrinally, there's some things. First of all, um, as much as Mary was obviously a special person to be chosen by the Lord for this, um, 
yeah, there's a lot of confusion about the work of Mary and her importance and stuff. Some people give her a too high of a place or say that she was without sin. Mary calls herself a sinner in need of a savior. And um, yeah, also Mary was born just like the rest of us are born. There's some traditions that get built onto that, but we need to say that. The other interesting thing is that um, his life purpose is given before before he is born. An angel comes and says, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now, if someone is going to be saved from their sins, the idea is not simply that they are saved from the punishment of their sins, but that they're delivered from the power of their sins, like it speaks about in Galatians chapter 1. That Jesus has come to free us. He has come to set us free from having to live a life of sin. And so here we have such a great amount of power and glory under such control and humility. So the event would be we're talking about today is the incarnation. And then second, we're going to look at the characteristic what is shown to us about Jesus in this and some of the other places in the scripture we can look at? Um, I think the most important thing here for us to pick up is Jesus' condescension. It, it, it really is that he, that he came down in such a way, such an extent that, that we can learn from that. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul makes an application out of the way Jesus came into the world as a man. And he says in verse 3, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves. Now, why would we esteem people better than ourselves? Are there not people that we are better than, according to the world? Are there not people that we are more accomplished than, or more good-looking than, or stronger than, or better at things than? Why would we not um, esteem ourselves better than others? He's going to go on and explain that. Look not, verse 4 of Philippians chapter 2, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And so, now he says, don't be concerned about what you want. Be concerned about the needs of others. Verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So that is the, that is the whole the whole hinge on which the whole door swings about this whole teaching here is that the reason this mind is supposed to be in us is because it was in Jesus Christ. And the reason we're called to live the way we're called to live is because that's the character of God. And the character of God was displayed through Jesus Christ in that he became a man. He continues on. <clears throat> Let this mind be in you, which was also in Jesus Christ, who being in the form of God, who being in very being, God, thought it not something to be held onto to be equal with God, but made himself. See, this is what I was saying. This is a willful choice. This wasn't something that happened on accident. It wasn't something he got sent from heaven and didn't have a choice in. He made himself. He actively made himself of no reputation. Now, how many of us care about our reputation and want to defend our reputation and want people to think highly of us? He made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant right? and was made in the likeness of men. 
and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Again, something he did to himself as a choice. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So it's not that there's no end to this. It's not that he doesn't have a place of honor and glory. It's not that he is not the absolute infinite perfect holy creator of the universe that deserves honor and praise and glory and blessing but the way which he gets to that is not the way most people would choose to get to that if they were in the same position it's not what you would expect from a deity that has been offended you see all the gods of the nations i've yet to find in other religions, even religions with many gods, or religions like Islam that have one god, I have yet to see this idea of God as a god of love be actually displayed and proven um, in history. You see, you can always argue about theories. You can always argue about things that maybe may or may not happen. But you see, Jesus put an end to all of that arguing, all of that questioning. He came down, and it says in John chapter one, that if you that he is the exact expression of the Father's will. Whoever has seen the Son has seen the Father. No one's seen the Father at any time, but if you've seen the Son, You've seen the Father. It says that in John 14, in John chapter 1, in Hebrews chapter 1, that Jesus is the exact image, the revelation of the, the character of God. So if you want to know what God would do in a certain situation, if you want to know what God thinks about something, if you want to know God's heart, you look at Jesus Christ. It is his name to which every knee one day will bow. And this one who knows that to him one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord of everything, of all of creation. He lowered himself lower than the angels. He made himself of no reputation. He, he took upon himself the likeness of men. He actually looked like a man. And he became a servant. Not just a man, but a servant. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Imagine the humiliation of this and what this shows us about the character of God. <laughs> you see, God, he's all-powerful, right? Could he have chosen any way he wanted to redeem his creation? Of course, he could have chosen whatever he wanted to do and done it, right? Could he have chosen to condemn the world and to start over? Of course, there's nothing wrong with that. He created it. It belongs to him. He could have destroyed us when we sinned. He could have destroyed Adam and Eve and started over. But he doesn't do that. He created us for a purpose. And, and he actually loves us. And his heart is towards us. And he, he wants to show us, to draw us to him with love. You see, I think it's Alexander the Great the Greek conqueror from millennia ago. He said, I only wish, I, this is not going to be an exact quote of him, but he says, I only wish that I could have people like Jesus does. You see, he, he had conquered the known world at the time, and he had many people that he could kind of convince to die for him, but he had to pay them a lot of money. And he had to give them a lot of a lot of privileges and stuff as a lot of soldiers need to get in order to fight and they were trying to conquer the world you see alexander the great knew you could conquer people through war 
And one day Jesus will come back to judge and to make war, and he will make all the nations his own. But Jesus didn't win people through conquest. He won them through love. He won them through the heart. And Alexander the Great says, There's a man who has not lifted a finger to fight. And he has millions of people on this earth who today would die for him out of love, out of free will, because they love him. And this, yeah, this idea can be applied to us. How, how is it as we look at Christ, we can be made to be like him? And, and this way, how are we to emulate this? How are we to look like this? How, how does this play into our lives that the God who created all things, who is outside of time, stepped down into time as a man and was born and came as a child that was helpless and needed a mother, to survive. Well, the first thing we can look at is in Galatians chapter 6. Yeah, and you see, you're going to see as we go through this, throughout the next little bit of time here, that we are often asking ourselves the wrong questions. You see, the questions we should be asking ourselves, or the one question we need to be asking ourselves is always, does this bring glory to God? Is this what the Lord would have me to do? Is this what is best for the kingdom of God? Is this what is best for others? You see, everything about our lives has to be about loving God and loving others. And often people ask these questions like, um, am I allowed to do this? Would God punish me if I did this? Um, how close can I get to doing this without... Uh, committing a sin. And those are all the wrong questions to be asking. You see, we're supposed to be following. We don't get to heaven by following Jesus. We get to heaven by putting our trust in him as our substitute who took our place. But we're supposed to be, as Christians, the idea is we're called little Christs. That's what the word Christian means. That's what they called the Christians. They said, these people are like Jesus, so we'll call them Christ ones. And it's the word Christian that a lot of people use now. So Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1 says, Brothers, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. So we're told, that if we see someone in sin, if we see someone in failure, we are to restore them. But if we are ones who are spiritual who are restoring them, it says we're to do so in a spirit of meekness. You see, that means <clears throat> meekness is strength under control, which is exactly what Jesus was like. And he was strength under control. Right? And here... We're told to consider ourselves, to recognize that none of us is any better than them. Now, this is like way, way below what Jesus was doing. Hey, Jesus actually never, he never was tempted by sin. He was tempted to sin, but he wasn't tempted by sin. You see, we can understand this. We should have empathy for our fellow man because every one of us has struggled with sin. Every one of us is tempted to sin and tempted by sin and struggles with that. And so he says, consider yourself lest you also be tempted. And we're told, even as people, that we should be meek. And of course we should be meek and humble in the way we do this, because even Jesus was. And Jesus didn't have to be. Jesus wasn't like us. He didn't have sin in his own life to deal with. And that's why God can righteously judge sin the way he does, because God is doing so justly. He's not judging someone when he does the same thing. He has never sinned. He never will. And he tells us when we restore someone, when we see someone overtaken in sin, 
our attitude towards them is supposed to be humble, right? to be caring, to be gentle, right? not to not to be wanting to expose it, not to be wanting to make a big deal out of it, but to be wanting to see them come back to the Lord in the same way that we would that Jesus has treated us, that we want others to treat us when we fail, we should be treating others. And we should be considering ourselves that we are not that we are not um, impervious. That's a tough word probably to use. We are it's not impossible for us to be affected by sin. Then the next thing is in Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, in verse 3 it says, For I say through the grace given to me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now, you know, there's nothing more disgusting, nothing more repulsive for people to see than someone who is proud and boastful. People that present themselves as more than they are or feel the need to tell everyone consistently how wonderful they are and all of the things they've accomplished and done. We're to have an attitude of humility. And it says, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think sober. Soberly is with a correct mind. So God's saying, think about yourself the right way, in a, with a clear mind. And if we look at ourselves with a clear mind, we would remember that we are just sinners. That we just are people that deserve God's judgment. And sometimes when people ask, you how you're doing you'll hear someone say better than i deserve and that's because they have a correct view of themselves they realize what do we deserve really all we deserve is god's judgment and we haven't been given god's judgment and because of that we should not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to now we're told to um further on in verse 16 of romans chapter 12 it says be of the same mind one toward another do not mind high things. All right, don't become don't become an intellectual. Don't try and figure everything out. Don't try and impress yourself with the amount of vocabulary you can have and the big of words you can use. But condescend, there's that word, condescend to men of low estate. Do not be wise in your own conceit. Do not mind high things. And associate with the lowly. Condescend to men in humble places. So what does this look like for us today? To condescend to... As Jesus came down to our level, we are to come down to the level of people we're ministering to. Whether those people are homeless, whether they're poor or hungry, whether they're uneducated and we need to use different words to communicate with them, whether they're children. You see, I've always said, if what you're saying and what you're teaching cannot be communicated to a child of the age of 8 or 10 or 12 years old, whatever, some children, they, they grow at different rates, their intelligence. But if you can't get across what you're saying to a child, there's probably no point teaching it to an adult either. <laughs> you see, Jesus had a big thing about children. He said, if someone offends one of these little ones who believes in me and causes them to stumble, it'd be better for him if a millstone were hung about his neck and he was cast into the depths of the sea. He said, let the little children come to me. Of such is the kingdom of heaven. Their angels always behold my father's face. <laughs> Jesus loves children. Jesus loves those who are not as smart or as intelligent as everyone else. And why is that? I think possibly it's because naturally they're more humble. They're more teachable. They're willing to learn. They don't think of themselves as impressive. 
you see the biggest the biggest problem we have in North America is this intellectual materialism and atheism people that say there is no God and why do they say that because they are so proud you see um what was said to Paul has become true of them much learning has made you mad it says in Romans chapter 1 people professing to be wise they have become fools they have such a high view of themselves they don't realize that all of the knowledge we could accumulate in our whole lifetime even if we lived a thousand two thousand years isn't even a tiny little speck of the knowledge that actually exists on the in the universe and all of these people if you ask them they're they're so proud about their ability to communicate and to think that they have ignored the knowledge of god that is written on their hearts and so you ask them are you sure that god does not exist and any of them that says they're sure about that they're saying that they know everything in the universe because in order to know that god does not exist you would have to know absolutely everything which would make you god and that's what the bible says satan promises to adam and eve you can be like god you can be your own god you can be in control of your own destiny you don't need to answer to anyone you can just answer to yourself and a lot of the problems in the world we see today are from people answering to themselves and doing what they want to do and not having this attitude this mind that was in christ jesus associate with the lowly condescend to men of low estate be humble you see none of us has any reason to be proud everything we get is because of the grace of God nothing that we get is something we deserve other than God's judgment so everything we receive is from the Lord as a gift that should make us thankful it should make us humble and not not proud there's there's one more thing I'm gonna say and then I'm gonna stop I don't want to force anything Sometimes I might go shorter, sometimes I might go a little bit longer. But um, what does it mean to be humble? See, a lot of people have this idea of humility that it means to think poorly about yourself. You see, everyone knows that to be proud is to think highly of yourself, and then to think um, humble is to think lowly of yourself. I actually want to challenge that idea. See, I think humility is not, condescension is not so much thinking lowly of yourself as much as it is simply not thinking about yourself at all. You see, it's not about um, showing ourselves to people as humble and telling them all the things that we're bad at, whether or not we are bad at them, or this kind of false humility where we're constantly putting ourselves down and speaking poorly about ourselves to me that's not humility it's just another form of pride what true humility is is i i know some people that i would think of as having this humility is thinking not about themselves at all you see when they talk to you they don't feel the need to tell you about how bad they are they don't feel the need to tell you about how good they are their only concern is um finding out how you're doing they don't even think to talk about themselves. And when people ask them about themselves, they just kind of, they don't, they don't discuss it a lot. They simply kind of brush it off and they say, yeah, I'm doing better than I deserve or the Lord is good to me. And sometimes they may talk about their struggles and they may ask for prayer and stuff. But the focus of their life is to minister to others, to lift others up. You know, Jesus said, whoever, whoever uh, exalts himself will be humbled, but whoever humbles himself will be exalted. It's like I said before, there's nothing wrong with living for rewards, with living with this in mind that that we are, we do have a goal we're aiming at. We do want to be great in the kingdom of heaven. But the reason we want to be great in the kingdom of heaven is because we want to be close to Jesus. And we want to know him and have a place of honor there that he will give to us. And that we want to live for, to live out of love for Jesus. So yeah, as we think about this, that Jesus came down from his glory, not one of us ever has an excuse 
to not humble ourselves. See, if Jesus could humble himself from being the God of the universe into coming down as a man, showing himself to people, being exposed on the cross, needing humans to help him live and to grow as a baby, if he could make that choice to come down into, to our level so that he could lift us up, we have no excuse in our relationships with other people to not come down to their level so we can lift them up. And so that's, and that's the application of that as you think about this aspect of the life of Christ, how he became a man, that we would remember to, to associate with people that perhaps we would think lowly of and to not feel the need to parade ourselves as anything great. And also to not spend a bunch of time talking about how bad we are either, but to have our hearts and minds fixed on him. It says in Colossians chapter 3, which I'll close with, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1 to 4. It says, If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. A dead person can't be proud. You see, we are so wicked, we are so evil, we're so sinful, that all that we can do with our flesh is have it put to death and be alive because of Jesus Christ. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. And in the same way that Jesus, after condescending to such a low place, is given the place of highest honor, we eventually, by God's grace and his goodness, will be given a place of honor in the kingdom. He says we're going to appear with him in glory. Or we have an inheritance with him. These are things that are hard for us to grasp and comprehend why God would do a thing like that and why he would have such a love and such a desire to give us a place of honor and to want us to experience his goodness. And do you know what? I actually have got to read one more passage because this is a culmination of this. Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. Here's the disciples arguing about who is the greatest. They're in the presence of a, a man who is God in the human form, who from all eternity knew everything that was going to happen and has created and given strength and life to every person. And they're among him arguing about which one of them is better than each other. It's such a ridiculous picture, except for we know it's true about us, too. That is our attitude. That is how we are as people. We think like that, too. Matthew 20, verse 25, down to 28. Jesus calls them unto him and says, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise authority over them, and those who are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. Whoever wants to be great among you, let him be your servant. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be the servant of all. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. So this says, the greatest person in God's eyes is not that person who's given all the honor and special places and special places to sit and honor at conferences to speak and to be treated with dignity. You know, the highest place of honor is somewhere in the back of the kitchen, washing dishes or mopping the floors and, or doing the things that no one sees that have to get done. Those who are chief among you, it says, should be the servant of all. So the greatest, the greatest place of authority is the person who is the servant of everyone. 
because Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So may the Lord help us to live with that in mind and to keep that at the forefront of our minds as we continue on today. Let's just uh, pray. Father in heaven, we just come before you today once again. Uh, Lord, uh, and there's nothing spectacular or wonderful about me or the way that I speak, but Lord, just pray that your word would be applied to those that have been able to be here today, that your word would be powerful, and that as we think about Jesus and his loveliness and his humility and how he came down to our level, when we couldn't do anything about it, Lord, help us to be like that to other people. Help us to treat others as we would want to be treated and to treat others the way that Jesus did. So, Lord, help us in this way, not to have the wrong idea of humility and not to desire to be given to places of honor, but, Lord, that we would look for ways to serve, to serve in humility. Lord, that is the greatest place in your kingdom, according to Jesus. And so, Lord, we thank you for this upside-down kingdom we're living in, where the servant is actually the greatest. Lord, help us to serve and to walk with Jesus. Lord, we just thank you for him. We don't deserve him, but he, he came down to us. He loves us. And we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.